Sorry, let's take a look at the questions. I noticed a few good ones. I scrolled through them and hopefully I, I stop on the good ones uh, that stood out to me. PFT PM Posse, would Jerry or Stephen Jones truly give final say over the roster to bring in Sean Payton like they did once upon a time with Bill Parcells, especially since they aren't currently trying to get public financing for a new stadium? But what they've done in Dallas over the past 30 years, it started with Jimmy Johnson having, as a practical matter, control over the football operation. They won their two Super Bowls with Johnson. They ran him off, and the team was so good they were able to win a Super Bowl without Jimmy Johnson, with Barry Switzer as the head coach. Then Jerry, and I'm just going to put the entire family operation under Jerry's umbrella. Jerry decided he could be the one who builds the team. He wanted to build the championship team rather than ride sidecar to Jimmy Johnson. So they go through that process, 96, 97, 98, 99. They get into the early part of the next decade, and it bottoms out. And that's when he goes on bended knee to Bill Parcells and gives him the keys to the car. So Parcells comes in, builds a team that becomes a contender. But then four or five years later, Parcells is out and Jerry decides, I'm going to go back to being in charge of the team. I want to be responsible for the building of a championship team. And since then, they've, they've managed to show that they've figured out over three decades how to go about getting the right players, resisting the temptation to draft Johnny Manziel in 2014 and taking Zach Martin instead. One of the smartest decisions that team has ever made and other decisions along those lines have put them in a position where their team is relevant, but are they good enough? And Hey, look, if they were going to hire Sean Payton in 2019, they already have an understanding as how the personnel is going to work. Whether Sean Payton has final say or doesn't have final say, are they going to listen to him? Or are they not going to listen to him? How does it all work? How does it all fit? The fact that Payton was ready to make the plunge three years ago tells you, Whatever they need to do, however it needs to work, they're comfortable working with Sean Payton. And I would continue to put them at the top of the list, especially because Jerry knows if I'm ever going to get this guy, this is it. And if I don't get him, I got to worry about somebody else getting him. Somebody I compete with may end up getting him. That's a problem for the Cowboys. So I think it'll work out. Whatever the details, whatever's in writing, whatever happens as a practical matter, when it's time to figure out who to keep, who to cut, who to trade for, who to extend, how to build your team, I think they'll have that worked out. Good question from Corey Joskowitz. You've referenced both on the show and in your book about the NFL needing to be more proactive with officiating, gambling, and information security to avoid class action lawsuits and potential governmental intervention. How would this initiate? Joe Schmo going to his lawyer and more people joining. Look, it's, it's simpler than that. You don't need more people joining. And I'm surprised it hadn't happened. Let me give you this example. The allegation that Stephen Ross, the owner of the Dolphins, offered former head coach Brian Flores $100,000 per loss during a 2019 season when Ross wanted to tank so he could get the first overall pick and draft Joe Burrow. That's the theory. That's the idea. That's the allegation. Now, the NFL's investigation is still pending, and I think the NFL is not going to come to a conclusion that would bolster Brian Flores' lawsuit. If you come out and say, hey, he's right, you make his lawsuit, the one that they said initially is without merit and have reiterated that more recently, the lawsuit has no merit, you give it merit. If you say, hey, you know, the guy's got a point here. We disagree with his position. We think he's wrong about everything. We think the case is borderline frivolous. But, you know, when he says Ross offered him $100,000, got a point there. So wherever that lands, there's already enough chum in the water for the sharks to show up. And all it takes is one person. Now, back in 2019, I think there were maybe six or seven states that had legalized sports betting. But what you could do, you find somebody who wagered on the Dolphins, assuming they were trying to win or cover or whatever, made a wager on the Dolphins that went sideways, and you argue they weren't really trying to win the game. They weren't trying to cover the spread. It corrupts the process. So you file a class action on behalf of everyone out there who bet on the Dolphins to either win the game on a money line wager or to cover on a point spread or to make it to the playoffs or not make the playoffs. Any Dolphins related wager premised on the Dolphins actually trying to win. And I assume now. I, 
I generally assume that electronic information is widely available because digital systems are premised on saving, not deleting information. Apparently that may not be the case based upon some non-football related news that's out there currently, but, but I digress. At the risk of digressing any further, I'll just say, I assume that it would be fairly easy to recreate the bets that were made on the Dolphins, money line or against the spread. There's your class action. And you don't need to go out and sign up all the people. Anyone who bet on the Dolphins under the assumption they were trying to win becomes part of the class action. And I thought a lawsuit would come fairly quickly. Again, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. Still could, but that's how it would work. If there's some big scandal, whether it's bad officiating, whether it's an argument that there's some sort of officiating controversy where someone's on the take, whatever it may be, it's just a matter of finding one person who made a wager, assuming that everything was on the up and up. That person becomes the class representative. You file the lawsuit and off you go. And that's separate and apart from the possibility of Congress getting involved, of an agency being created. As I've said before, the Securities and Exchange Commission didn't appear until five years after the stock market crash of 1929. It takes a bad event to spawn more regulation or plenty of prosecutors out there with broad discretion who can be looking around for corruption that could be happening with teams, with the league, with officiating. But class action lawsuit, very easy. And we've seen frivolous class, and I don't like to use the word frivolous, frivolously. Any frivolous lawsuit is a lawsuit filed against you. But there have been some borderline frivolous class actions we've seen for all sorts of things over the years. So it just doesn't take much to get it started. And again, I'm surprised it hasn't already happened as it relates to the allegations involving Dolphins owner Stephen Ross. Neil watches PFT. Why don't more players renegotiate their contracts after year three? Ones that I can think of that should. We know about Debo and Kyler, DK Metcalf, Josh Allen, the defensive end, Josh Jacobs, Devin White, Deontay Johnson. Well, I mean, look, Josh, Josh Jacobs, they're not giving him another penny in Las Vegas. They're done with him. They didn't pick up his option. He's not going to fit with the new approach to the running back position there. But as look, I, I remember interviewing the commissioner 2010 for the one and only PFT season preview magazine. We did it one time, one time. And that's it. That was when the league wanted the rookie wage scale. They wanted to prevent a situation where a Ryan Leaf or a Jamarcus Russell makes millions and never earns it. And I, I spoke about this very recently here. That's fine. But what about the guy that earns it, who's denied the money he should have gotten because he has played well enough to get it? And Goodell told me at the time, basically, we trust that the teams will take care of that. Well, the NFL took care of it because what they did in that same CBA, they adjusted the commencement of the ability to negotiate a second contract from after two years to after three years. So for the first three years, there's not, nothing can be done. Guy could have the best three seasons ever for any player at his position, and he can't get a raise until his third regular season ends, period. So we've seen some, some teams swoop in and get a deal done with a guy after three years. For first rounders, you have a little more time because you've got the fifth year option. But the teams that are committed to treating their guys the right way will do it. And yes, there are devices available for the players to apply pressure. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Holdouts, hold ins, whatever the case may be, asking to be traded. But, you know, the bottom line is, when you get a guy in the draft who ends up being a great player, I think for the teams that are treating their players the right way, that are properly rewarding the men who become the best of the best on their roster, it's in their own best interest to pay those guys quickly. So everyone knows we take care of our own. Everyone knows if you come here and you play at a very high level, higher than anybody thought, especially if it's a second, third, fourth round pick who becomes a star, or if you just live up to your potential, like a Nick Bosa. Right now, they got Nick Bosa and Debo Samuel. Both guys have earned second contracts. Neither guy has gotten one yet. That, to me, is wrong. Because I think the teams that have a guy who's gotten it done for three years, who didn't get paid huge money on the way in, who has outperformed everything 
that he has been compensated with needs that content. It's, a, it's just a powerful message. And I keep waiting for a player who's on a playoff team who finishes his third regular season and who says to the team, I want my contract now, not after the playoff run, because I'm still incurring the risk. The window's now open. Let's go ahead and get everything lined up. So the day after our regular season ends in my third year in the NFL, I get my contract. That's the perfect way to do it. That's the ideal way to do it from the perspective of teams that really want to take care of their best players. I'll leave it to you to decide whether the teams really do want to take care of their best players or whether the teams want to take care of themselves and use every potential angle available to them under the CBA for their own benefit, even if it's to the detriment of players who continue to perform while carrying injury risk, while continuing to be underpaid. Oh, contract's a contract. Baloney. The players have options under the CBA, and I fully encourage them to take advantage of them. Another one from Neil Watches PFT. Reacting to my tweet from yesterday about live golf and how Charles Barkley throws out the idea, hey, if they're going to give me $200 million, I'll quit everything and I'll go be – a commentator for the Live Golf Tour. I mean, they're buying up everyone, money flowing everywhere, all traces back apparently to Saudi Arabia. And I raised the question of when's there going to be a Live Football? And look, I mean, I've, I said it more jokingly than seriously, but let's consider the reality of a couple of things. First, the public has an insatiable appetite for football. Now, we prefer NFL football, and it would be very difficult to set up an in season competitor to the NFL. Very difficult, especially because any company that would do business with an in-season competitor, any broadcast company would probably seal its own fate to ever be in business with the NFL ever again. You have to be ready to burn that bridge, to blow that bridge into complete and total smithereens if you're going to do business with some competitor for the NFL. But I mean, competition is part of American life. Everybody has to deal with competitors. The NFL doesn't. They dealt with the USFL and what happened? They got sued and the verdict was $1 at the end of the day. So could someone with unlimited resources who can't buy an NFL team? Because I doubt that the NFL is going to decide to start selling to foreign interests. That's just not something the NFL is inclined to do unless a team is going to be in that foreign country. But what if gigantic oil money from Saudi Arabia says, hey, how much can it really cost? We go out and buy up the best players. Like the USFL initially did when it was a spring league, it was still paying the kind of money that attracted NFL talent. The WFL back in the 70s, paying big money to attract NFL talent. That's the last team that really tried to do a head-to-head -head competition with the NFL, other than the USFL, which was spring, 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 until they moved to the fall and it all fell apart. My point is this. You think about the money that's available, broadcasting, gambling. See, the legal legalization of sports wagering creates, I think, an opportunity to have more football, more sports more things on which people can bet. Now, is that the best way to do things? That's not for me to decide. But the point is, especially if the technology improves and you can bet during games, more football means more opportunities for people to bet, means more opportunities for the house to win. Because at the end of the day, if they're setting the odds right, the house always wins. So would it be crazy to think that live golf would become live football? Is that crazy? I don't think it's crazy. I think it's crazy that no one has tried, that no one who's got money to burn has tried to create a competitive league that would come in and pay guys a crap load of money to defect from the NFL. And I know that, look, would that be good for the NFL? No. Would it be good for NFL fans? No. But we're all about competition. And that's what the PGA is currently dealing with. And the PGA has gotten itself in hot water because it is engaged potentially, allegedly, possibly in anti-competitive practices with the threats that are being made. 
see when when competition shows up, you got to behave a certain way or do get yourself into an antitrust situation. That's what happened with the USFL and the NFL. The NFL is not going to go away quietly and they may play dirty to try to fight back any challenges that may be out there. But if I'm the NFL and I see what's happening with live golf, I at least game out the possibilities of what would happen and how we would properly handle a threat from somebody out there with a ton of money who decides to try to carve out a little piece of the turf and to take away some of the best players in the National Football League. I don't think it's as crazy as it sounds, especially as we see it play out in golf. Neil watches PFT. What do you think of the Panthers' new helmets? 60% of the time, they work every time. They, look, and this, this dovetails with a question that Paul Silva asked. What other teams need to bring in alternative or throwback uniforms? As a Vikings fan, I want to see the old school purple people eaters uniforms and helmets. I think the fact that the NFL has brought back the rule allowing teams to have two helmets, not limiting to one, I think that makes it incumbent on every team to have a second helmet. If you've been around long enough to have a throwback, get the throwback. If you haven't been around long enough to have a throwback, like the Texans with their red helmets or the Panthers with their black helmets, then just get a different helmet. But do it. Why wouldn't you do it? I, I know I, you know, there's going to be some get off my lawn folks that want to turn on the TV and see the same uniforms all the time, but, but, but do it a couple games out of a year. You sell those helmets, create some excitement, create some buzz for that game. I mean, the giants are putting back their old uniforms with the old giants helmet and the old giants look from the eighties against the bears and Washington this year, a couple of games, you otherwise look at it and say, well, I don't want to drag my ass to the stadium that day. Well, now you get to be there the day that, they have the old 80s uniforms. So I just think it makes sense for every team to take full advantage of the opportunity to use that second helmet, have that second uniform, sell jerseys, sell helmets, and get people excited. I mean, it's an entertainment business, and that's part of the overall entertainment. Eric and Teddy, a.k.a. Pauline, do you think Bill Belichick will ever win another Super Bowl? How will the Patriots do this year? Two questions. And I think they can be good and not be a Super Bowl team, and maybe he won't win another Super Bowl. I don't know. I don't know. You have to look at where they are right now. They, they think they can turn Mac Jones into their next franchise quarterback. But even then, will they have enough pieces around him to win a Super Bowl? And I think the coaching staff is a big part of it. They're going to miss Josh McDaniels. At last word, Matt Patricia potentially is going to call offensive plays. Okay. Now, look, Bill Belichick has morphed from defensive guy into a football coach who can do it all. Maybe Patricia is next. Maybe this is part of grooming Patricia someday to take over for Bill Belichick. But... The AFC is uh, a meat grinder this year. 13 contenders as I see it. It's not going to be easy for the Patriots. It's not going to be easy with this transition in the coaching staff. And the point that I've made before, and I'll reiterate again here, having your kids on the coaching staff creates problems. When you get blown off the field by the Bills, when you give up 47 points in a playoff game, and maybe you need to make big changes, in the defensive coaching staff, and you can't because you're not going to fire your kid. And if you're not going to fire your kid, how can you fire anybody else who's working on the defensive coaching staff? I still think that's one of the reasons why the job duties are so deliberately vague right now. We don't know who to blame for any problems with coaching because we really don't know who's doing what. Now, as the season approaches and unfolds, we'll have a better idea. But I, I think that this, this reality of nepotism in coaching. If the coach's kids aren't as good as they need to be, what do you do? You can't fire them. And then it's a ridiculous double standard. It's hypocritical if you start firing others. And uh, it just puts more pressure on Bill Belichick to do what he has to do to get it done. Now, will he ever be on the hot seat? Look, we, we've heard Robert Kraft bemoan the fact that the team hasn't won a playoff game in three years. And six Super Bowl wins probably gives a guy a little more leeway than he otherwise would have. But I don't know. How many years without a playoff win will be too many before the Patriots decide that it's time to end one era and move on to the next one? I don't know. But as Tom Brady keeps winning Super Bowls without Bill Belichick, that puts more pressure on Belichick to find a way back to the Super Bowl, and back to the podium, holding up the trophy to cap a season. Let's see what else we have here. I'm running out of time. Uh, let's see. 
some good questions here that that I I, uh, I just need to pass on because I don't have, as I said, at the risk of repeating myself, as I buy time, as I look at these questions, I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, all right, all right. I, there was a couple more that I saw that, oh, here we go, Bill's blog. Why doesn't the league have two bye weeks? It helps the players rest more, expands the season another week, dilutes the amount of games that are on at 1 p.m. every week. What is the argument against it? They did it in 1993 for the 16-game season, two bye weeks. The networks didn't like it because it did reduce the total number of games. It made for a greater chance of just not compelling weekends, not compelling primetime games, not compelling Sunday games. I think that as the league expands, and in 1993, there were 26 teams. Now you've got 32 it could be easier to give every team a second week off. It could be an easier sell to the networks. And as I think the league continues this trend toward getting away from having so many games happen all at once and have fewer games, especially as in-game betting eventually proliferates, all the more reason to have more time slots, more weekends, more primetime games, Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night, other nights of the week maybe, fewer games at one o'clock Eastern, more opportunities for people to gravitate around one or two games at the most at the same time. I think there will be a time where that second bye week makes sense. Look, the, the ultimate end result that probably won't happen in my lifetime, I would envision this. 20 games in the regular season, no preseason games, because it's been 20 games forever. It used to be 16 and four before that it was six preseason games and 14 regular season games now it's 17 and three they'd like to get to 18 and two i think one of these days it's going to be 20 and zero and you're going to have 40 teams is that the high end eventually 40 teams again not in my lifetime but i think that that's the end result expanded playoffs maybe even another weekend of playoffs i was thinking about this last night you can have 40 teams and put 20 teams in the playoffs. And what you would do, the first 12 would get a bye, and then the, the last eight would whittle down to four more to get to 16. And then you go 16, 8, 4, 2. You could have five weeks of the postseason. You could have 22 weeks of regular season action. You could have football for 27 weeks out of the year, 28 when you include the bye between the conference championship games and the Super Bowl, 28 weeks of the year. And every week, more opportunities to gamble, more opportunities for the sports books to make money, more opportunities for the NFL to make some of that money, more opportunities to put games on TV that people watch. Yeah, two buys would be part of that. If you have 20 games with two buys, that's how you get to 22. You throw in the five postseason games, it may take 50 years to get there, but I think that's a chance where the NFL is going to end up. One more from Tommy Caruso. Carl Nassib was a good player for the Raiders last season. Will he find a new home soon or are teams too afraid to sign him? You know, I had seen some noise in recent days pointing out that Carl Nassib remains unsigned. He was on Good Morning America recently. Is that a coincidence or not? I don't know. He made it clear he wants to still play. It, there's a chance he's at a point in his career where he's not just going to accept minimum salary opportunity. He made good money the past couple of years from the Raiders. I think it's about 17 million. He made the last two years. He can afford to wait for something better than league minimum. And I think for a lot of players, you get to a point where you just decide it's not worth it for me to do all the stuff I have to do to play football. If I'm just going to get another million dollars this year, I've already got enough in the bank where I don't need to worry about that. I'll wait for a better opportunity. That may be part of it, but I think it would be naive to assume that there isn't some coach out there, some owner out there that would, would pause distraction. Even though Carl Nassib, after he came out last year, was not a distraction at all. It was a non-issue for the Raiders, and that was encouraging. And as Nassib said this week, we hope to get to the point where people can just be let people be who they are. Don't stigmatize. Let people be who they are. How does it affect any of us if everyone else can just be who they are? 
I don't know. Maybe it's unrealistic. It should be simple. But the reality is you got plenty of coaches, plenty of owners, plenty of GMs. I don't know how many, but enough that for them, maybe it's a factor. Distraction. Distraction. The word that gets used as the replacement for, I just really don't want this guy on my team. So I don't know of anyone who is not considering Carl Nassib because he's openly gay, but it's not like they're going to come out and say it. Are they going to tell us? They're not stupid. They may be horribly misguided, but they're not stupid. So we'll see how it goes. I expect he'll get an opportunity at some point. And I have a feeling that if he wanted to be on a team right now, he could be, but that we're not talking about a range of compensation that makes it worth his while to go join a team. But we'll, we'll see what happens there. Let's go ahead and end it for today. Three for three. Two more days left of PFTOT before we're back next Monday with PFT Live. Thanks, as always, for some of your time. Check us out around the clock at profootballtalk.com, and have a great Wednesday. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.